All right. So I'll start with a question from Zoom. Uh, see if anything comes to mind on this. Thank you for this beautiful introduction to working with the breath. I found your suggestion of treating the breath as a delicate bird very helpful. Then I had an image of a bird settled below my diaphragm during the meditation. Please could you speak more about the imagel, imaginal images in terms of breath meditation? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think it varies from person to person as to what resonates for you. It's interesting that the bird did resonate because that's the Buddha's own simile. He talked about a little quail that if you crush it, if you hold it too tightly, it gets crushed too loosely and it flies away. So I just adapted it because I'm also not so concerned at this stage on a three day retreat about the breath flying away. I'm more concerned with creating those wholesome qualities in the mind whereby the breath will enter and can stay with your mind fairly easily. Um, so in the beginning, I'm less worried about the mind wandering and more um, interested in encouraging that arising of right intention. Because when you get the motivation, the intention, the attitude right, everything else starts to fall into place. So I can share one more little image I once had. It sounds a bit crazy. <laughs> it's always strange to share one's personal kind of creations during meditation. But um, this was again on a long uh, rains retreat. As monastics, we do three months rains. At least I commit to that every year. And it's really three months of solid meditation. That's the way I can function in my role. Um, and that was that the breath was coming to my mind almost like for servicing. So it was coming in and I was like the service station that was like looking after this breath. And, uh, and my mind was so happy to see the breath. And the breath was so delighted to see my mind that it got really happy. And it was like each breath was kind of almost like cleaning the window of my mind, like the windscreen of a car. So each breath was kind of cleaning it with all this loving kindness, but not expecting the mind to become bright, not expecting the mind to be beautiful just caring for the mind and it was so delighted to see the mind that the breath felt very happy so each breath was like a little being cleaning this window screen of my mind so i don't know for me that kind of thing is usually spontaneous it's not something i kind of think about first and then try to apply it's just an image that comes into my mind quite naturally as I practice the meditation. So I don't kind of cling to the image, but it's just whatever perception, whatever imagery helps to calm the mind, to brighten it up, to bring that happiness. It doesn't really matter what it is. Obviously, we have to differentiate between fantasy and reality. So you have to use these things as skillful means, but also, you know, don't cling to them as uh, methods in and of themselves. Because, you know, sometimes something works and the next time if you sit down intending it to work, it usually won't. Because again, the wanting, the craving has crept in. So it only works when we're unconditional with these things. We do them because it's just fun to do. And it works at that time. So I can't really think of more images right now. But um, yeah, you'll probably start to see the breath more and more as an image if you continue with this meditation practice on focusing, focusing on the bare occurrence of the breath. What tends to happen is that the mind starts to interpret that breath as a mental image, something very, very simple though, nothing sort of convoluted like a bird or like a, the breath cleaning the mind, but something more like a softness or brightness or a glow something like this in the mind and that's the beginning of interpreting the breath through the mind door instead of through the body sense okay uh, okay i'll do one more on breath meditation from here and then i'll come to people in the room would you encourage changing the place of focus when it comes to the breath I've been focusing near the nose for a long time and it comes quite naturally now, but I caught a cold and my nose is blocked, giving a feeling of suffocation when I stay at the nose. Do you think I should change it consciously or not interfere and just give meta to the feelings that come up? Thank you for all your instructions. I'm really enjoying this retreat. Excellent. So the word focusing for me sometimes rings a little bit of an alarm bell, not that it's wrong, but just that it, tends to connote a little bit of effort and force that may be just a little bit too much. Um, 
of course, when we've been practicing that way on, on the nose area for a long time, it does come naturally and then you can let go into that rather than kind of hold it tightly in one place. Um, so yeah, maybe this is an opportunity to let go a little bit of concern for where that breath arises and just notice breath in and of itself because you are breathing, you know, whether it's through the nose or the mouth or I don't know, through the pores of your body, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's your nose or your mouth. So there is breath there. So it's a good opportunity, I think, to, of course, give meta to any feelings that come up, especially if you're getting frustrated or irritated. It's always a troubleshooting method in a way to overcome any ill will, any restlessness, you know, frustration with the practice. Um, so metta is always a good thing. But at the same time, I think it might be helpful for you to just learn how to experience breath as breath without so much uh, emphasis on where it arises. Because eventually we have to let go of that anyway to get into deeper stages of meditation. So I hope that helps. And uh, yeah, anything else from the floor? Yeah, hi. Do you have any like, ideas for doing a drowsy making of this wishing? Because sometimes I'm like breathing and then start doing some weird stuff where I think I might be going into like, a little bit of a dream. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the person's asking about drowsiness and um, whether I have some suggestions because when they're uh, observing the breath, they go into a little bit of a dream state for a while and the thinking is a little bit dreamlike. So I'm sure that's something pretty much everybody here can relate to. And I was having this conversation with a couple of people already today. So um, contrary to many teachers' advice on this, I have practiced uh, the instructions that my own teacher in Perth gives with a little bit of faith, which is to actually let it be and leave it alone and not to be concerned with it. As you said, you know, in the question that you felt a little bit frustrated, but you kind of knew that wasn't very appropriate. And that's really true, that that doesn't help the situation because basically you're tired. So again, the mind is being used to kind of very... Um, uh, prominent objects, you know, things that captivate the senses and grab the mind and now you're going to something subtle like the breath. And of course it's a much more peaceful rhythm, you know, it's the rhythm that our mother breathed <laughs> when we were breastfeeding or when we were held on her chest, you know, there's this very soothing rhythm to the breath. So it does tend to lead to the um, drowsiness initially and it's your first day I think with us now. So, you know, this is very, very natural and Ideally, you'd have a retreat that lasted 10 days or 20 days or 30 days and naturally the mind would start to brighten. So don't worry about that. It's almost like when you try to stop the car that's running at 110 miles an hour, like our taxi was actually. Were you in that taxi or was it Derek? Yeah, I got a taxi with uh, Ajahn Brahm with my teacher and the guy was going 110. I knew it was fast, but I didn't look at the speedometer. I tried to relax and then afterwards, Derek said, uh, it was 110 miles an hour. So, okay. So if you're expecting the car to suddenly stop, it's going to create a big accident. So it's almost like the drowsiness is part of the brake system in the car. In that way, you could almost see it like a friend. It's just kind of helping the calming process. And gradually, once you go through that, the mind will brighten up. So yeah, I would say just bear with it, let it be, be kind to yourself and you know, it's just a result of tiredness, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. During breath meditation, I felt a lot of joy and metta when I moved to the walking meditation and focused on walking. Oh, maybe. Ah, okay, there was a comma there. During me breath meditation, I felt a lot of joy and metta. When I moved to the walking meditation and focused on walking, I felt tired and stressed, though relatively present. Perhaps I need to build up metta and should have continued to focus on this. Yeah, I mean, this is just understanding the mind in different modes. It's natural that joy and metta also passes away. <laughs> you know, the important thing is that you understand the causes for that joy and metta to arise, but also understand the causes for it to fade. And, Maybe in this case, moving into something more complex um, caused it to fade away, but that's okay. We can't cling to any of these experiences and they're naturally going to change. 
So next time it could be the opposite. Next time you might feel peaceful while you're walking. You know, you might feel stressed and tired when you sit. So it, it doesn't really matter. It's just about learning to handle and relate kindly to every single mental state and notice where that preference comes in and how that can actually create more of a problem than the tiredness and the stress in itself. It can be, you know, that added kind of not wanting it or wanting to go back to something more agreeable that, that causes the biggest problem there. So, yeah, it's always a process of adjustment, you know, perhaps, yeah, more meta would be great in your next sit, but I wouldn't look at it so much as what you should have done or could have done, but more like, what does my mind need right now? So when you come back to sitting next time, you can look at the state of your mind and, and figure out, you know, is there some agitation, some stress, and what is the antidote to that? Maybe it's metta, maybe it's an attitude of contentment. So always trying to work with what you have and uh, not cling to, to the rest. It's a good lesson in impermanence, I think. Okay. Okay, this is nice. When I wanted to send metta to a friend at the beginning of the meditation, Instead, I felt gratitude for what she'd done for me one day. With this gratitude in mind, I turned to the breath, and then it overwhelmed me and became a crying meditation. I tried to find out what was behind those tears, feeling of missing her, wishing to be there, but finally waited until it passed. This <coughs> never happened to me before. How to handle such a situation? The way you have, I think. <laughs> that's totally fine I mean sometimes these strong emotions like gratitude and love they kind of unlock something inside which is a kind of tenderness or a sorrow I often find that the two are very close actually you know it's like a melting a softening of the heart so sometimes emotions that we've been kind of pressing down come up and sometimes in that sorrow or that sense of missing someone there's something very beautiful and poignant there as well so I think it's fine. I mean, it depends how you were waiting. Were you waiting until it passed as in, oh, I wanted to go away, I'll bear with it? Or were you waiting with kindness, like waiting, you know, with patience and gentleness and interest towards that state of mind? So that's really the key, you know, like in all meditation, whatever you have is not in your control. Whatever arises is beyond your control. You can't predict what's going to come up when. But what you can do is maintain this wholesome attitude to it and make sure you're relating to it kindly. So many, many things are going to happen that have never happened to you before, but it doesn't really matter because that attitude, those three right intentions can become the way you relate to anything and it will always transform them in a wholesome way. So anybody in the room? Yes, one here. Oh. Uh -huh. cultivating happiness um, and then you talked about pure refined happiness uh -huh. and then I think I think probably you were trying to get I'll, I'll use rough words but trying to get us to go to the pure refined happiness is in that last meditation but I probably didn't know <laughs> but I'm just I'm just wondering about how much really you need to be meditating to get to that state and I know yeah. these states aren't coming to me but because I mean I might meditate you know twice a week or something yeah week. yeah and, and then you're talking about going on longer retreats and right doing that. yeah yeah, yeah it's a good right yeah yeah no it's a really good question so the person's asking for the sake of the zoom uh, that we talked about happiness and then like refining it and purifying it and getting to this like really pure refined state of happiness uh, through meditation and they're wondering like how much they need to meditate in order to so-called get to it but they know that it's not getting. Um, <laughs> so it's a very good question and I think uh, it's not so much what we need to do to get that it's more of a how can we learn to appreciate the happiness that's here? Because there is a lot of happiness that we can get from our ordinary daily life and also the ordinary meditation that we do in daily life. Like it's a rest, it's a break. You know, there's a gladness there that we can have the silence, we can have the time. And I think with happiness, it's like, 
any amount of happiness, if you're not content with it, then it's never going to satisfy. But even a little bit of happiness, if you really value that, and if you're really content with it, then it becomes purer and more refined in a sense. So I don't know if that really answers, but obviously the longer you meditate and the deeper you go, I do think that we can access happiness that's increasingly internal and that's coming from a state of a mind without hindrances, which is a lot more reliable and, and steady than the happiness that comes and goes. So of course, long retreats are wonderful for that, but like you pointed out, if you go in there with the desire to gain that, it's probably not going to happen. And of course, long retreats can bring up all kinds of stuff. It's not you know, bound to be the case that there's all this happiness inside. Um, but I think it's an ongoing process. It's more to do with practice over many, many years and just putting in whatever time you can with the right motivation. That is definitely the fastest path. So, yeah, it's the continuity and the kind of the attitude you have towards everything you do that's going to bring the most happiness in the end, because that's the way you transform your mind, you know, by developing wholesome perceptions. And then that becomes a habit so that you're able to find the happiness in unexpected places more and more easily. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so it was a great teaching. My breath disappeared during meditation, but appeared several times subtly for a few minutes and disappeared again. Is it normal? <laughs> just, just in response to the first, uh, last part of that question, is it normal? This is a really common question. People always say, is it normal? And I always feel like, you know, whatever arises has to be part of nature. It has to be arisen from a cause. So in that sense, it has to be normal because it happens. So yes, don't worry. And this is a common experience, especially when the mind starts to go calm. Remember in the um, fourth stage of the first tetrad, so the long breath, the short breath, the whole breath, and then calming the breath. It sounds like this is where you're at. So the breath is becoming calm. And it will still be there. It's just that it's so calm that the mind at that time isn't able to pick it up. I mean, you are still breathing. So, you know, you came back again, you were still alive. But uh, this is what happens initially, like uh, when you're moving more and more into the realm of the mind, the breath kind of disappears for a while and we think there's nothing happening. Then it comes back again, sometimes because we're not very comfortable when it's gone. <laughs> so we bring it back. Um, but over time it starts to disappear and then the mind starts to brighten up. So it's a kind of stage between experiencing the breath with the body and experiencing the mind. And when the breath disappears for longer periods of time, you might find that you start to see like a mental image of the breath, maybe lights in the mind, maybe complicated images sometimes initially. Um, and then they will start to settle down too until there's something very steady, which is like a mental image of the breath. So yes, it's normal and um, good. It just shows that you're calming the mind. The second part is, uh, uh, my second query is that two parts of Anapanasati Sutta are coming up, up at the same time. Please explain. Yeah, I mean, all of these uh, stages are part of a natural process. So they're not entirely indistinct. I mean, as the breath calms, also more joy arises. Again, it's like tuning into that happiness of peace. So they're not really separate, but it's just that over time, the, the happiness will become stronger and more predominant, and then that will take over the mind. So it's all fine, it's all good. Um, and just, yeah, just maintain that right attitude towards everything that happens. I'm not sure if that's a very good answer, but it's all fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. One more from here and then I'll come back to the floor. <laughs> I'm really worried you did have your hand up before, which I didn't. Yeah. I was going to do one more from here, yeah. I think. Yeah. 
Uh, meditation today was more difficult than yesterday with unpleasant experiences of my past coming to mind. Focusing on the present was more difficult. I'm quite happy I was able to stay with the full meditation time without giving up. Yay! Are there more effective methods of handling negative thoughts or more practice with meditation will help? Yeah, more practice will help, definitely. Um, one thing that may have happened here is that you were trying maybe too hard to focus on the present moment, um, perhaps to try and keep those unpleasant experiences out, possibly. Um, whereas actually those unpleasant experiences were part of your present moment. So sometimes, you know, uh, the best thing to do at that time is just to really see if you can embrace those experiences as well. See if you can give space for them to be there in the mind. So it sounds like you did that. You stayed with the meditation. And uh, again, you know, it's just practicing the wholesome qualities, practicing, you know, more metta, practicing relating to these things with kindness, um, recognizing that they're just conditioned phenomena, they're not yours, it's not a problem, and just allowing them to be there and understanding that they'll pass. So it's always tricky when we talk about handling things and focusing because often what we mean is, you know, trying to do something so that they'll go away. But the Buddha did say that uh, suffering has to be understood first of all and we can't really understand it without meeting it at least that's my feeling so these are opportunities to learn about suffering and to learn how the way you respond will either diminish that suffering or increase it exacerbate it by not wanting it to be there so they're opportunities and um yeah, sometimes if it's really difficult, it's okay to move as well and do some walking meditation or start to recite some phrases of loving kindness. You can also have some self-compassion. You know, this is difficult right now. Um, I'm here for myself. I care for myself. You can add these kind of things to your meditation just to help you stay present rather than pushing things away. Okay, so on the floor. Did you want to? Did I yeah, to go for it. Um, but it's a little follow on to Liz's question, which is, uh, I guess, the, when you say that, you know, as, as you go on with your practice, you'll, you'll find that the joy and the happiness just more naturally arises. Is, is that your experience? <laughs> Great question. So someone's asking if um, the happiness and joy gradually increasing is my own experience from my own practice and life. So I guess one way I describe it is um, that there are ups and downs in everybody's life. Like there are times of happiness and times of quite deep suffering still for me. Um, I do go through that. But in general, if I look at the trajectory, I would say that there's a kind of, it's like, in the beginning it seemed to shoot up because I felt I found the meaning in my life. So I was really full of gratitude and inspiration for many years. And of course, within that time, there were things that happened in my life that caused me suffering, but the general baseline was higher than it had been before I found the path. So I would say like over time, it's kind of a gradual increase, but that increases with ups and downs. So it's kind of up, down, and sometimes down, and then up. But it's easier to bounce back in the sense that I know where to look for the real happiness. And a lot of that happiness for me comes from living a life that's meaningful for myself. So it's, the happiness is less related to the kind of um, uh, the Vedana, the experiences that I have, you know, the, whether I feel good or not, which is called also hedonic happiness. And it's more to do with what psychologists call eudaimonic. I'm probably saying it wrong, which is the happiness of meaning and the happiness of feeling one has a path. So I think for me, it's that's a deeper kind of happiness. There's a sense of confidence, a sense of gratitude and joy, but it's a cultivation. I mean, if I wouldn't reflect on the blessings in my life, if I wouldn't kind of, you know, notice the blessings that I have, then 
I don't know, really. I think it's, again, it's a cultivation of the mind. So, yeah, the more I cultivate, the more readily I can tap into it, I would say. Um, but it also changes from time to time. Like if I'm on an, having a lot of retreat time and around a lot of spiritual friends, then that happiness that develops inside might be more consistent and stable. But then when I'm very busy, and especially if I'm stressed or tired, then that happiness can subside for a while. But the happiness of meaning in what I do remains. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I'll come back to the Zoom. Uh, how much longer do we have? We have another 10, 15 minutes. Um, it's like someone already asked about that. Uh, how do I scroll? Here we go. Uh, <laughs> okay. During walking meditation, my mind became very restless and conjured up 101 reasons why I'd be much better off meditating sitting down rather than walking. <laughs> yeah, we're not laughing at you, but we're just laughing because this is an experience that I'm sure most people can relate to. It's simply restlessness. It, it's just, you know, one of the hindrances to meditation that we all experience from time to time. I'm new to medita walking meditation and found it rather forceful. However, walking is one of the four postures, so surely a valuable practice. Any suggestions? Yeah, my main uh, suggestion, I guess, is to take everything that's offered here as part of a retreat. So it's like a platter. It's like being given a kind of uh, cheese board with different kinds of cheese. And, you know, you can pick one or the other. Like you, you're basically getting introduced to all the different kinds of cheeses. But eventually, like in your daily life, you find which ones work for you the best, which ones are more flavorsome and more nourishing for you. So, you know, you don't have to do the walking at a certain time. You can pick these things up when, for example, your mind is a little bit active, the restless, the, the walking meditation can maybe help to calm it down. Or sometimes you might find walking meditation really peaceful and then you want to continue it longer. So generally speaking, I mean, you don't have to do walking meditation, but you'll find that it works in different ways at different times. So don't worry about it. It's not really what you do in your meditation that's important. It's more that meditation is a portal to see the way the mind works, to see the way we do conjure up all these reasons to avoid the present moment when we don't like it very much, right? And you'll be doing that anyway, like whether you're walking or sitting. Sometimes when I'm working, I do that. I conjure up 101 reasons why I didn't ordain to sit at a computer. <laughs> yeah, it's true, right? But um, I've learned to just notice that as restlessness and discontent. And then when my mind's in a much more positive and metaphor and loving mood, I think, oh, isn't it great? I don't mind sitting at the computer and getting completely burned out as long as people benefit. <laughs> so it really depends on one's state of mind. But I think it's, it's very nice that you noticed what was happening in your mind. And that's really the progress. You know, we meditate not for results, but to understand what's going on. OK. So I think it's the floor's turn. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question? I'll come to Shad if not. But I want to give people who haven't asked yet anything a chance. Or you don't have to ask. You can comment or share. No, nothing. Did you still have a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this morning you talked about right effort uh -huh. among other right things. Um, <laughs> And what that does for me is it suggests there is wrong effort. Yeah, um, correct. Stephen Batchelor talks about wise effort, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I kind of feel brings in insight and wisdom rather yep. than right and wrong. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so the person's asking, did you hear that? Because she's quite close. Some people did. About right effort, yeah, the word right for some are, and that that implies there's a wrong. Well, firstly, I'd say there is a wrong, absolutely. Because as I said, you know, we can be making effort in the wrong direction. We can be making effort to acquire. We can be making effort to kind of 
um, gain more than our share. We can be making effort to be stingy and selfish and that's not right either morally or in the sense of helping us progress on the path. So I don't mind the word wise because obviously it has to be, all the path factors have to be applied with wisdom. But the thing is, anything can be wise, but which direction is it leading in? To me, the word right means right in the sense that it's leading to the goal that the Buddha laid down. It's leading to enlightenment. And in that sense, it's right according to the goal. So if you want to, you know, experience complete freedom from suffering, complete freedom from greed, hate and delusion, it's right in that context to lead you there. So to call it wise is true. I mean, definitely there's wisdom involved in applying every aspect of the path, but you know, not all wisdom leads to enlightenment. So I guess that's, I'm also not 100% on right. And I'm often wondering what a better translation could be. Appropriate could be, could be one because it could also be appropriate in terms of appropriate for awakening or enlightenment. Um, but as you study these things more and more and you understand the nuances of each limb of the path, you will see that wisdom's there. Um, and also, as I understand the Buddha's teachings more and more, when he uses words like good and bad, right and wrong, usually good and bad, um, or wholesome and unwholesome, it's talking about bad in the sense that it leads to suffering, good in the sense that it leads to happiness, not as a value judgment but more as concerned with his main teaching, which he says in a nutshell is suffering and the end of suffering. So that's how I see the path, yeah. Great. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I'm fairly new to this kind of meditation and keep getting interrupted with thoughts that it's self-indulgent and I should be engaged in direct social action. How best to reconcile these perspectives? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that we've been taught by our societies that you know we shouldn't look after ourselves and that that's an indulgence of some kind because it's certainly not a sensual indulgence. And I'm sure that many of us are more inclined to indulge in food or to indulge in sex or not monastics. <laughs> or to indulge in other kind of pleasures without necessarily feeling it self-indulgent. But then when we sit to meditate, we have these kind of thoughts arise. And from a Buddhist perspective, this can be seen as um, Mara, which is like uh, that force in the mind that doesn't want us to actually go deeper and experience inner peace. And it's also a little bit of doubt, I think, about maybe what the purpose of the meditation is and where it's going to lead. But over time with the practice, you probably will find, and this is certainly my experience, that the more you're able to work with your mind and handle emotions in a wise way, in a kind way, you know, learn how to not get sucked into the afflictive emotions, learn when to take a step back, learn how to build up energy in your mind, it will make you much more effective to serve in the world. So the two things for me are completely related and not separate at all. There's a time to engage in direct social action, but it's not probably right now <laughs> because you did apply for this retreat in good faith, probably because you felt you needed a break. Um, and one of the most difficult things with anyone involved in like direct social action, which I consider myself very much engaged in with establishing um, better conditions for the ordination of fully ordained women in the monastic tradition. Um, for me to do that, I have to have my own space, my own practice time. You know, I take a full three months, if not four months a year for my own meditation, and that gives me enormous strength. And without that, I would burn out and not recover. So in the long run, you know, I'm preserving myself. So that's the way I see it. We need to keep taking breaks. And just see those thoughts as self-indulgent. I mean, again, you're noticing them, so it's great. It's mindfulness. Um, and just, oh, that's interesting. What is this? You know, just, just have an attitude of curiosity towards it. But, but see if you can persist. And over time, you probably will find that, you know, the kind of thoughts, the kind of compassion that you're developing in meditation translates really, really beautifully into your social action as well. 
because the more we incline to relieving suffering for ourselves and others, the more that has to manifest as actions of body and speech. And if it's not, something's wrong. You know, if you're just saying, forget the world, sod everybody else, you know, it's all about me and my enlightenment, I don't consider that right practice at all. And for me, the people that I most respect on this path and that I have confidence in as having gone quite far, if not the whole way, they're people who serve tirelessly and they know when to take a rest. That's one of the ways they can continue to be effective. Okay, any, anything else from the floor? We'll do one more question either from the floor or from the Zoom. Yep. phrase that intrigued me and still keep coming back is there are no ordinary moments and there's never nothing happening uh-huh and um and it's like when when i'm in the moment when i'm out in nature it's a little bit like you know when you look at the leaf that where, where the leaf was yeah and you go, oh my gosh wow and in a sense, it's not special, but it is because yeah. it's like <laughs> our attention goes on it. Yeah. And, um, and just lying in the bath last night, you know, just my ears were in the water and I was breathing. It's like, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. And, and, and I just kind of wondered if in your experience how you've managed to kind of uncover because it's not making something happen right it's uncovering mm -hmm. what is happening yeah and just finding awe in that experience and yeah i wonder if you've got any comments any reflections yeah in your experience or teachings okay yeah so the gentleman's asking about um special moments that every moment somehow special somehow new and there can be a lot of awe found in the present moment and um, how that happens really. And uh, for me, I suppose I understand it as, um, again, perception becoming kind of more uh, tuned in maybe to the joy. And again, the hindrances being more and more absent. You know, first of all, being more present, it allows you to be present and to see those little things, whether it's the like patterns of the leaves on the pavement or, you know, funny sounds or just things that stand out, you know, when you're really in the moment. So the present moment awareness is definitely part of that. And then uh, realizing that it's the state of your mind that adds the beauty to things. Who was it that said beauty is in the eye of the beholder or something? But it's really true that, you know, on a, a day when you don't have much meta in your mind or when you're annoyed or in a rush, you just don't see those things, you know, you're just not receptive. And even if you do, I remember as a teenager being quite depressed and my mom, bless her, really loves gardening and flowers. And I said to her, flowers, poof, they're just things that grow up from the ground. <laughs> and actually, I felt that was quite wise because they are just things that grow from the ground. But I think there was a bit of negativity there as well. <laughs> Because now, now I love the flowers and I find a lot of beauty in, in the tiniest little bush flower. So I think it's when the mind starts to um, become more suffused with lovely qualities like loving kindness. It really affects the way we perceive the world. The first thing that came to them as you were speaking yeah. was I think what distracts us from that is when we try to cling yeah. to that moment. Yeah, definitely. Is when we just letting it flow? yeah yeah so when we cling to one moment then we can't see the next moment because we're still clinging to the to the old yeah maybe the clinging comes in but also when you do realize there's so much beauty everywhere you don't really need to cling you can just kind of leave it and there'll be something around the next corner or something right there in front of your next step. The so, joy of a smile. The joy of what? A smile. The, the joy end. of a smile. Yeah. Yes. Very good. I think that's a good place to, <laughs> to end. So, um, yeah, I, I, we are going to end now because uh, I know I'm not getting through everybody's questions. And tomorrow I'll really make an effort to, um, to 
answer people who I haven't yet answered, if I can remember who that might be. Um, so for anyone who's there tomorrow and I haven't yet answered you, you could even write it in the message, first question or something like that. And I'll do my best to find it, to find your question and answer it. Um, but for the people here, I think it's probably enough input for the day and we'll have some meditation now and also for those on Zoom.